very good morning to you sir and uh, we are very pleased to have you uh, with us for this uh, interview thank you and uh, to begin uh, in our journey of science communication uh, what are your thoughts about what exactly is science communication i think science communication is no different from uh, any other form of communication you know uh, politicians communicate with large audiences uh, actors communicate with audiences and i think scientists also need to communicate with audiences uh, in order to convey concepts of science uh, findings of science advances in science which might affect uh, everyday life and which sometimes i think are just simply important for people to know so that they appreciate the world in which uh, they live they appreciate the bodies which they inhabit and uh, also they engage in the advance of uh, science and technology see today uh, science and technology are really the subjects which have really dominated all the advances which have taken place in the 20th century and therefore we use many things every day and we take them for granted right. uh, we don't know where they've come from and we don't know uh, what is going to happen in the future we can't predict the future but if you appreciate what science and technology has done over the last 100 years you won't be surprised by anything else that is going to happen in the next uh, 30 40 or 50 years of your lifetime we have been fond readers of your uh, editorials in current science and also you have a very uh, you have been a fierce communicator of science through the written word what are your views on probably is the pen really mightier uh, in terms of science communication and how how was your experience uh, i'll tell you a little bit about my writing career my writing career began uh, in a somewhat uh, strange way when there was a meeting of the editorial board of current science and one very senior scientist said that you can't have a journal which attempts to imitate nature or science without having an editorial now if you were to have an editorial then the responsibility of writing the editorial falls upon the editor so i was suddenly faced with the task of producing a column or an essay uh, every fortnight and uh, this was a somewhat difficult task at the beginning because you have to find a topic and then you have to find background material on the topic and then you have to distill everything that you've read and put it together in maybe 1500 words right. two issues that a writer confronts in such a situation one is to gather one's thoughts and put it down second to stick to a very rigid word limit and then most importantly stick to a deadline because if the journal does not come out on time then the costs of posting the journal to subscribers goes up by an order of magnitude so there is a great financial loss for journals which don't appear within a couple of days of the date printed on the cover these were the constraints under which i began writing but as i began writing over the years i began to enjoy it uh because this idea of looking for a topic reading about it and then putting it down becomes a habit and uh, of course you spend a great deal of time on it which might be spent in other ways but as far as i was concerned it became a hobby mm -hmm. and uh, of course there comes a time when uh, hobbies begin to dominate your life and then you decide that it is time to move on coming to science communication in the uh, written format uh, we have we have been seeing a trend where uh, we like we had a discussion right now about uh, 
sharing a lot of things over the internet and uh, kind of a previously we used to have uh, good lengthy articles uh, in the journals about discussing about recent discoveries and this thing nowadays it has moved on to uh, social media and uh, probably just talking about the crux of the uh, topic and not a detailed uh, uh, views and discussion uh, what 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 is your take on uh, these see for any serious student or even a serious member of the public who's interested in learning about a topic there's no substitute for the detailed written article uh, today on the internet uh, there are uh, articles which appear fairly long articles on blog sites which i think are extraordinarily powerful in communicating ideas in science at the same time there is social media with which i am much less familiar uh, like twitter where connections are drawn to articles or attention is drawn to articles and sometimes highlights of articles are in fact uh, provided in very few words but in many ways these are i think uh, much less important than the written word or the spoken word in uh, a lecture see i must tell you a little bit about uh, what i think is uh, the history of science communication you know it's not a very well known fact but you might ask yourself the question which is the first one way street in the world today most streets in most big uh, metros in india are one way streets but the very first one way street in the world is a street in london and this is the street in front of the royal institution and the royal institution is the place in the 19th century where first humphrey davy and later michael faraday actually did their periodic discourses and those discourses on science and science was just beginning to make its major discoveries at that time were actually physical demonstrations of experiments and who were the people who came to listen to faraday faraday's audience consisted of mostly victorian ladies and victorian ladies would come in horse drawn carriages and they wouldn't walk so the carriages would be parked as close to the door of the royal institution as possible much the way the very rich people in india draw up right up to the shop where they want to shop and uh, park their cars and disturb everybody else after a little while the street no longer became uh, possible and therefore the london municipality then declared it a one way street so it's really science which first caused overcrowding on the streets but what was faraday demonstrating faraday was demonstrating some of the most fundamental experiments which had ever been done in science he for example demonstrated the connection between electricity and magnetism and the principle of electromagnetic induction and there you realize that electric and magnetic fields were in fact uh, connected to one another and this set the stage really for major advances in physics which happened later when maxwell unified electricity and magnetism but you can see that his experiments would have been today if you go to a school you will find children demonstrating uh, the classical faraday experiment so the public is in fact attracted when the experiment was first done a british politician lord north i believe asked faraday the question of what possible use can this experiment be and faraday i do not know if this is really true many such stories are apocryphal he said that uh, my lord of what use is a newborn baby and uh, another response that he is reported to have given 
He said, my Lord, one day you will tax it. And today, of course, <laughs> we tax uh, the production of electricity. So I think communication has been central to the advance of science. It's only in the modern era that we've been accustomed to taking the fruits of science, the technologies which develop from science, for granted. And we now believe that uh, these have just happened. I think especially about the last point uh, regarding taking things for granted, we have seen many instances where there's a lot of miscommunication and uh, indifference by the society nowadays and uh, false claims over uh, traditional knowledge and uh, how science and uh, these things are different and uh, society claiming to be following one or the other. How, how, do, how should we as scientists or scientific community, community deal with this particular issue? See, I'll make this comment with respect to India. Uh, in India, we have recently had this sort of contentious debate between uh, the virtues of modern science and the kinds of advances which were made uh, by traditional science uh, a long time ago, maybe as early as 2000 or 3000 years ago. Now, I think most of this discussion is an extraordinarily superficial and politically charged discussion. And it has very little to do with science as we know it today and science as it is influencing our lives on a day-to-day -day basis. I think if you go out into the Indian population, I think the vast numbers of uh, Indians probably do not take this discussion very seriously. They know for sure that this is in fact merely a political discussion. On the other hand, you will find even people who are largely illiterate but who possess a great deal of common sense do appreciate what modern science has done for them. So today, for example, if you look at lifespans, we are all living, and I am one such, living much longer than we would have lived if we had been born a hundred years earlier in India. How have these lifespans actually increased? They have really increased because of our understanding of science and all the basic science which constitutes the fundamental basis of modern medicine. You now are in a laboratory which deals with microbes, but 100 years ago or 120 or 130 years ago when Pasteur and Koch were doing their first pieces of work, the idea of microorganisms as infectious agents was not, not really known. In the middle of the 19th century, one did not know that cholera was caused by a microorganism or that cholera was caused by sewage contamination of drinking water. Even after that connection between sewage contamination and drinking water was established, it was not known what caused cholera. It required to actually microscopically see the bacterium. But even after he had seen the bacterium under the microscope, nothing much could be done about it because one did not know what caused the watery diarrhea. It was only much later, in the 1950s, in Calcutta, when SN Day actually discovered the enterotoxicity of cholera culture filtrates, was the idea that there was a molecule. But even that molecule, the idea is, is that molecule now a toxin which acts systemically or is it a toxin which acts at a particular site, maybe on the cells of the intestine, causing water to go across the membrane and be secreted into the bowel? 
This is how patients get dehydrated. What is the therapy? Oral rehydration. So you can see that science has contributed in many ways over a long period of time to understanding a disease. Fleming's penicillin set off this huge interest in antibiotics. And if it hadn't been for streptomycin and penicillin, I think lifespans would have been significantly shorter in India. Today, however, we are dealing with the problem of indiscriminate antibiotic use and antimicrobial resistance. How do you, you communicate this to the physician? Physicians usually have a relatively limited understanding because the MBBS courses do not contain uh, compulsory courses in microbiology. They have a relatively superficial understanding of the phenomenon of resistance and therefore antibiotics are indiscriminately prescribed. They are prescribed even for infections which are clearly viral in nature. Uh, and the molecules that you eat then do not act on the organisms which are causing you a problem. The result of this is that communication of science and an understanding of science is necessary at all levels. It's necessary in this particular example, a little bit of this is necessary at the level of the patient, some of it is important at the level of the uh, physician, it's important at the level of the pharmacist, and most importantly, it's critical at the level of the legislator. Because finally, it's laws and regulations which are made by parliament. And today, if you ask, the poorest understanding of science, what science has done, what science can do, where science must be understood before regulation is introduced, this is at the level of the politician. It is at the level of the bureaucrat. And it is the bureaucrat and the politician together who frame all the laws under which medicines, for example, are dispensed and regulated. So I think I've taken only a specific example, which is close to your subject. But this tells you it is important for everybody to have some kind of intuitive feeling for science. I think a lot has to be and should be done uh, for specific uh, areas of communication in science. Uh, so what according to you should be the scientist role of scientists in science communication uh, in their part of their academic research as well as in their daily lives? You see here I will start with an example of science communication in the United States. One of the foremost communicators of science in the United States was the astrophysicist Carl Sagan. And Carl Sagan used to do this marvelous program on television. But you know, all the professional scientists uh, felt that he was in fact trivializing science by taking it out from the laboratory and then communicating it to a public at large. But the public really enjoyed his programs. Although he had done wonderful scientific work, for a very long time, he was not even elected to the U.S. National Academy because popularizers of science were sometimes looked down upon, that they were not burying themselves in their laboratory and uh, doing their research. They were not serious enough. But I think things have changed. Today, in the West, uh, the importance of science communication has been very well recognized for the last uh, 25, 30 years. Richard Dawkins, for example, uh, is a foremost communicator of science, but he's also a fellow of the Royal Society and uh, he's also a professor. So I think science communication now is a very important aspect of science itself. But it also turns out that most scientists are poor communicators and uh, while there may be reasons for this, my personal feeling is that most scientists 
do not take the trouble to train themselves to be better communicators. Uh, if they understand the science, there must be a way of simplifying the science so that it can be presented to a lay audience. And when I say a lay audience, you must remember that we are all a lay audience outside our limited areas of expertise. So there is, it is not that a scientist understands every aspect of science which is so vast. If you're a microbiologist, you certainly do not understand many things in physics or chemistry or in uh, the geosciences. And similarly, physicists must have a very good appreciation for uh, biology, at least as a layperson. For graduate students, it is now as a part of their academic journey, it is, uh, it is mandatory for them to publish uh, one or two scientific uh, articles during their course of uh, their PhD, uh, this thing. But how do you visualize the role of graduate students in taking science to the public? I'm not sure what requirement you're referring to, but if you are talking about this news item which I read recently in the newspapers that the Department of Science yes, yes. and Technology is thinking of a scheme by which it's mandatory for graduate students to publish one or two articles in the popular press. I think these are classic examples of government entering areas in which it is completely and totally ignorant. I think governments should stay clear of all such activities because mandates never work. Uh, everybody cannot be a communicator or for that matter everybody cannot now be a scientist. Everybody cannot be an actor. Everybody cannot even be a politician. So there are people who are good at certain things and you must encourage those people to give full expression to their talents. I'm sure among the graduate student community, there will be some remarkable communicators who are very good in writing, who are very good in presenting work in public, and therefore both the written word and the spoken word can be used for communication. I think these kinds of activities should come voluntarily, much in the way that your group is actually carrying out such activities. I think mandating students to write for the popular press before they have learned how to write their own technical papers for a technical audience is going to lead to a great deal of miscommunication uh, in science. I am a very strong believer that Government functionaries, ministers and secretaries to government should refrain from making public pronouncements on subjects that they do not understand. So, uh, recently we have seen that a uh, lot of scientific institutions have started their efforts in reaching out to the public with their small uh, science outreach initiatives. Uh, take for example in Pune, we have a lot of scientific institutions who are reaching out to school students, reaching out to uh, graduate students in uh, 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 organizing popular talks, uh, keeping uh, uh, say uh, experiments on display and uh, keeping continuous activities over the year rather than just uh, in the uh, science month which is in the February. We also had a similar kind of uh, thing which uh, came up in uh, the industry uh, where the CSR model uh, where the corporate social responsibility the, go the companies were asked to spend a valuable time and effort in uh, holistic development in and around their uh, their place of work and also try to engage with the society and bring about a positive change. Uh, basically I wanted to ask is the model that CSR uh, is helping industries to reach out to the public, similar model can or should it be done by the scientific institutions as well? Well, I think what you are asking me really is, 
should scientific institutions compulsorily be asked to spend a certain amount of their resources and their time in science outreach programs. I'll make a general comment on corporate social responsibility. Corporate social responsibility, again, is a kind of tax uh, levied by the government mm -hmm. on corporations, except that if the tax is taken directly by the government, then you don't know where it's being spent. Right. On the other hand, in this case, corporations are tasked with spending the money that they have to on programs that they identify and choose. I personally don't believe that this is a good model because most companies would then like to spend their money. There are a few enlightened companies which are exceptions, but the average company would like to spend its money really on topics which interest them and in some way feed back into their own enterprise because they do view that as a compulsory tax. They have to spend it. I think what we should work towards is a model in which philanthropic support for activities is encouraged because people actually feel that that activity is important and is going to feed back into their surroundings and in fact into their own lives itself. In the kind of outreach model which science institutions are doing today, you now try to take science to children. Now the question of course is, why do you take science to children? You take science to children hoping that the next generation will have a better appreciation of science than their, uh, the, than the preceding generation. I think this is probably not something which is going to work very well. I don't think we have enough communicators to keep the attention of children. And bad communication of science may actually turn children off science. Sometimes I think it's better to leave children alone. And uh, they are better at finding out things uh, for themselves. Communicating science to their teachers uh, may be something which is a little bit more important so that their teachers then develop an appreciation and interest for science itself. But I think it's important to communicate science to the general public. And in fact, sometimes to people who might in fact be enthused enough to support your outreach activities. So if you did start some kind of corporate outreach program, whereby you had a program which was entertaining enough uh, and where a company, for example, uh, hosted the program and their employees, uh, IT professionals, uh, highly educated people heard this, sometimes even uh, captains of industry, I think they might be more disposed to support outreach. You wouldn't then have to impose corporate social responsibility and then have a bureaucrat define what comes under the heading of social responsibility? Uh, does the building of public toilets come as social responsibility? Does supporting a specific research project come under social responsibility? This kind of distinction would not be necessary. I think in some cities there are organizations and clubs, for example, of chief executive officers yes. who get together to discuss business matters, but once in a while, once a month or once in two months, they have somebody come in to talk on a more general topic. And what I have found is that uh, everybody is actually interested uh, in science because they do know that science has transformed uh, their lives. And people who have now reached a certain stage in their lives are also very aware of biology because you know when your biology starts failing that's when you begin to take a great interest in biology so you will find that interest in science among um, what I would call senior citizens is rather high and even today I believe it is senior citizens 
readers of newspapers like the Hindu who uh, still probably read more science columns than uh, any other target audience. But I think that that is the need of the art to also the print media to have I would not call a dedicated column but frequent and often uh, articles by uh, scientists about uh, pressing issues in science or uh, advancements in science. Yes, here I would like to make a criticism of the way science is being communicated in the newspapers. Today, for example, if you look at the pages of the Hindu, occasionally the pages of the Indian Express, uh, you find that science in India is being communicated as an unending series of discoveries and advances, when it is not so. And therefore, every laboratory experiment is now hyped and translated into some major breakthrough, uh, particularly in the biomedical sciences, mm -hmm. where I think the general public is in fact interested. This I think will eventually lead to a trivialization of science communication. It will also lead to a lack of credibility of Indian science. On the other hand, it's more important to have exposition of concepts with which people can relate on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think here there is no better example than the regular columns which used to be and still are written by Professor D. Balasubramaniam in the Hindu on entitled Speaking of Science. So you can clearly see uh, in Professor Balasubramaniam's writings and in the writings of the correspondents on the same page a distinct difference. This is why I feel it is important for practicing scientists, graduate students who are doing research in the laboratory, to actually turn a little bit of their attention, if they have some talent, towards writing seriously about uh, these kinds of advances in science. From the entire team of uh, Vices Lab and uh, NCMR, I extend our heartfelt gratitude for uh, in a short uh, notice uh, you agreed uh, to come and share your thoughts. Well, thank you very much.